Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Now this is another O level paper which is the November 21 paper 2 2 and I'm going to explain it and revise the topics which are discussed in it. Uh, now as we all know this paper is for uh, 1 hour and 45 minutes and you have to do a section A and a section B. Section A you have to do all the questions and in section B also and then section C you only have a choice. Uh, question number one, the diagram shows a photo micrograph of the lower surface of a leaf. Now some of you are clear about it, some of you are not very clear about it. I want you to just see a few diagrams. Now I want you to see how this leaf, a section has been taken from the leaf. It has been taken from this area and then this is what we see. We see the upper epidermis, the palisade, the spongy, the chloroplast. And then you see if you separate the upper and the lower epidermis, so then you see these guard cells in it. So they've shown you a view of this. The upper epidermis at times can have stomata as well. But in dicots, of course, the stomata are on the lower surface. Now another diagram for you to visualize and see what diagram we are giving you and where we have taken this from. Then what we have to understand is the question implies that you have to really look at this and say name each of the parts labeled A to C. Now A to C, what was A to C? Yes, simply A is the epidermis or the epidermal cell, uh, B is the guard cell and C is the stoma or you could have said the stomata or you could have said the stomatal pore. So any of these would have been correct. So A epidermis, uh, B guard cell or guard because cell B is guard cell and uh, pore C would be the stomata or the stomatal pore. Then coming to the next part of the question. Next part of the question says, in an area affected by air pollution, the surface of the leaf becomes covered with particles. These particles reduce the amount of light. So they have told you this, that it reduces the amount of light entering the leaf and may block all the pores of the type labeled C. So it's going to block all the stomata, the stomatal opening. So if you know the function of it only, then you can do this question. Explain how this will affect the production of starch by the plant. Number one, they've said light. Number two, they've said the stomatal pores are closed. So less or no CO2 will enter because stomata are closed. Then because you have particles, so less light, so less, uh, less light absorbed by the chloroplast. Then less photosynthesis. Less photosynthesis means less glucose made. So less glucose means less starch made. So you have to go in the right sequence to understand that if there is less light, then stomata are also closed. So if you knew what was needed for photosynthesis, you need CO2, water, light and chlorophyll. So if you knew all that and you knew about photosynthesis, you could easily have done this question. So less or no CO2 entering or diffusing into the leaf, uh, less light absorbed by the chlorophyll, less photosynthesis, less glucose produced and less starch produced. But of course, I'm not saying you had to write all these points because these are about five points. You only had to give me any four of these. Then coming to the B part of the question, a species of caterpillar, a species of caterpillar, underline this, the holly looper, feeds on the leaves of the holly plant. So the caterpillar is the holly looper, feeds on the leaves of the holly plant. Holly plants produce red berries that are eaten by a species of bird, the song thrush. Song thrushes also eat caterpillars and are eaten by hawks. Use the information above to complete the food web by writing the name of one species in each box. Draw arrows between the boxes to show the direction of energy flow between organisms. So everybody needs to concentrate. They've given you some clues about it. They've just said holly here and then they've said there's two marks for that. Look at the marks and think of the marking scheme when you're doing these questions. So the easiest thing was that holly, holly looper, song thrush, and hawk and then you must show the arrows correctly of course because the song thrush holly and then of course the holly looper was on the holly and how you have to do these arrows so if you got all the arrows correct and all the organisms correct you got your two marks for that then state for the food web above the number of species that are producers the species that are cons consumers and the trophic level so producer is one which is the holly which I'm just writing because if the food was, you just have to state the number of it. And the consumers are three. Why are the consumers three? Because holly looper, song thrush and hawk. Holly looper, song thrush and hawk. Holly looper, song thrush and hawk. They, they are the consumers. And then the trophic levels are four. Why are there four trophic levels? You see, 
this is one the trophic level this is one this is two this is three and this is four is feeding level trophic levels are the feeding levels so there are four trophic levels in this and always remember the producer is the first trophic level and then of course you can go on ahead of that question two the diagram shows the circulatory system of a fish the lungs of a human and the gills of a fish both have a large surface area for gas exchange. Fine. Now it says heart. Look at the heart here. Then look at the aorta here. So this is the gills here. And these are the capillaries of the body tissue. So it's a diagrammatic representation. So please understand this. Now it says state two differences between the structure of the heart of a fish and the structure of the heart of a human. Now naturally this is a two chambered heart while the human heart is a four chambered heart. So you can see the difference in the beginning. You can see that there is this is a two chambered heart. The human heart is a four chambered heart. Then this would have two valves in it. You see this valve here and this valve here. So it has two valves while this one humans would have four valves as you remember that. Then fish has uh, two blood vessels while in humans we have four blood vessels, the pulmonary artery which goes to the lungs and then comes back by the pulmonary vein and then the aorta which goes out of it and the vena cavas which bring blood to the heart. Uh, then fish chambers are the same size while the human chambers are of different sizes. So you could have come with any one of these, any two of these differences. But when it says differences, you've got to be clear that you compare the two very correctly. So this would be the differences that we are going to be talking about. Now, I mean, I've done a sort of a table like this and I've said, okay, fish, humans, two chambers, four chambers, two valves, four valves, two blood vessels, four blood vessels and chambers of the same size, chamber different sizes. Now coming to the next part of the question. Now here, this is a little technically a little difficult. Draw a ring around the correct words to complete the uh, sentence below. The pressure of blood in the aorta of a fish will be what can it be higher than the same as or lower than the pressure of blood in the aorta of a human okay now let's just revise a little bit of the chapter well now when you look at it the vena cavas bring blood to the right atrium and then the blood goes into the right ventricle and then it goes to the lungs right so this will be the pulmonary artery but then from the lungs it comes back to pulmonary vein and then we remember that the left ventricle is very thick and then out comes the aorta comes out of here and you know makes this big arch here. So the lung sends the blood back to the left side and then the left ventricle wall is very thick so the pressure in the aorta is very very high. Here what do we have? The heart is pumping blood to the gills which are actually the lungs and then it's going into the aorta. So there is no return to the left side of the heart because there is no left side of the heart. So naturally what we need to understand is here what is happening. This is the uh, heart is pumping blood to the gills and then from the gills is going to the body. So it is losing pressure. While here what was happening, it was going to the lungs, then coming back and then the ventricle was pumping blood into the aorta. And this would be the aorta here in this situation. So understand why it will be lower than so the pressure of blood in the aorta of the fish will be lower than so you have to place a ring around the correct word so lower than what the pressure of blood in the human now coming uh, to the b part of the question the photograph shows an antarctic ice fish the blood of antarctic ice fish is colorless fine state which component of the human blood is not present in the blood of the antarctic fish naturally the red blood cell is not present so, or you could have said red blood cell, or you could have also said uh, erythrocyte, or you could have said hemoglobin as well. So, this was a simple, what, why is it, uh, so it said it's colorless, so it doesn't have any color, it's a color, it's just like liquid, which is a clear solution. So, then it comes to some, a lot of information which you need to read very carefully. Antarctic ice fish live in the Antarctic Ocean where the water temperature is very cold. Okay, so the temperature is very low. Aerobic respiration is an enzyme control reaction, so we're going to have less aerobic respiration because it's very cold. As I've told you, aerobic respiration is an enzyme control reaction. More oxygen is able to dissolve in the water, okay, at lower temperature. So this is another phenomenon, more oxygen per unit volume 
more oxygen is able to dissolve in water. You have 100 ml of water, it has more oxygen in it as compared to in warmer waters. So more oxygen in 100 ml. Uh, Antarctic ice fish have a larger heart. See all the information which is being given to you. Larger heart, wider blood vessels and a greater volume of blood. So human beings have 5 liter blood, so they probably have 7 liters. So greater volume of blood, larger heart, wider blood vessels than fish of the same size that live in warmer water. So please look at all this information, read it very carefully, understand it, take some time over it and then start and look at the question. Now the question is difficult, it's always a suggest, it's a bit difficult question, suggest how Antarctic ice fish with colorless blood are able to survive in the low temperatures of the Antarctic Ocean. So, I mean, low temperature means less aerobic respiration. Why? Because enzyme reactions would be slower. That would have got you your two marks. Because you picked that up from the question that aerobic respiration is an enzyme controlled reaction. So, you say less aerobic respiration. Why? Because enzyme reactions will be slower. So, less oxygen will be needed. But as the water contains more oxygen, so more oxygen will be absorbed by the fish. So, there will be more oxygen in the plasma. More blood, why? More blood means more oxygen supplied to the body parts. And supplied to what? Supplied to the organs or the tissues or the cells of the body. So, everything you have to pick up from the question. More volume of blood. The temperature being lower. The fact that respiration was an enzyme control reaction. So, simple, you know. You can pick up points from the question and you could have given an answer to it. Less aerobic respiration. It's told in the question that, you know, uh, the temperature was low, so enzyme control. So less aerobic respiration, slower enzyme reaction. So you got your two marks for that. Less oxygen needed. Why? Because if less aerobic respiration is going to take place, then less oxygen will be needed. More oxygen absorbed by fish because we said in the question, more oxygen more dissolves in colder waters. More oxygen in the plasma, more oxygen supplied to organs, tissues and cells. Now look at these, there are seven mark scheme points, but you have to give me only five. So what does this tell you? Write a lot, write more so that maybe one or two points are wrong, You're, it is compensated by those correct five answers. Question three, the table shows the mass of each component in 250 cm cube of cow's milk. Carbohydrates is 11 grams, fat is 8 grams and protein is 8 grams. Now it says a 250 cm cube of drink of cow's milk provides 14% of the total mass of protein required each day in the diet of an average adult human. Calculate the total mass of protein required in the diet of an average adult human each day. You must state your answer to one decimal place. Now it's giving you, um, I mean I would have done it simple way, 14 is 8, so 1 is 8 out of 14. And how much is 100? 100 is 8 out of 14 into 100. Maybe my maths is a little weak, but you had to figure this out your own way. That 14% is 8 grams. So 14 is 8 grams. How much would be 1 and how much would be 100? Because it says calculate required in the diet of an average adult each day. So if it's in percentage, so 100 would be the total is 14% of the total mass of protein, 14%, 14 out of 100. So the answer to this was 57.1, 57.1 and of course if you had written grams, you got this mark. So 57 got your mark, 0.1 got your mark and gram got you the third mark. Then let's go on to the next part of the question. State two important uses of protein in the body. Now important uses of protein are lots of them. So number one is growth. Number two is repair. Then you could have said anything else like muscles or you could have said the nails and skin or you could have said hormones or you could have said enzymes or you could have said antibodies, hemoglobin and uh, protein are part of the membrane component. So any one of those could have got you your two marks. So anything, growth, repair, muscle, hair, hormones. If you named a hormone, please remember insulin is a protein hormone. But estrogen, progesterone are hormones, but they are steroidal hormones. So please do not mention them. Then enzymes, then antibodies, hemoglobin, or if you had said collagen. And of course, parts of the membrane, cell membrane has a lot of protein component. In it. it has protein channel proteins in it for active transport. So please understand it because you could get an essay question on this. 
Then the B part of the question, the table below lists uh, four components of a balanced diet for an average adult human. For each component listed, the percentage of the daily requirements provided by 250 centimeter cube of milk is shown. Vitamin C, zero, vitamin D, 30, calcium, 30, iron, zero. Describe how a 250 cm drink of cow's milk contributes to the health of an adult human for each of the components listed in the table. So contributes to the health. So you've got to be understanding. And this is for another four marks now. And the total question is nine marks. So, I mean, healthy-wise, you've got to look at it, how it would be healthy and how it would be unhealthy. So no vitamin C causes scurvy. You have to know the name of it. But you could have said it causes gum disease or delayed wound healing. And if you didn't know the word scurvy, you'd still got the mark for it. No iron, so it results in less hemoglobin. You could have said less hemoglobin, less number of red blood cells, and of course, less oxygen transported, so less uh, lack of energy. Then vitamin D, if it's present, will prevent rickets. Or you could have said bones and teeth, it will become strong. Or calcium, again, it prevents rickets. So lots of calcium in it, so it will help the bones and the teeth, and it will help in blood clotting. So any of these you could have said, if you didn't know, remember the word rickets, but if you said anything about calcium being uh, uh, strengthening the bones and the teeth and preventing blood clotting, you would have got your mark for that. Question four, a study investigated the probability of pregnancy resulting from sexual intercourse on specific days of the menstrual cycle. The graph shows the results of the study. Now, days before ovulation, Five days before ovulation, percentage probability of pregnancy was about 5%. Then on the fourth day before ovulation, it was 10%. Then on the third day of ovulation, it was 20%. Then on two days before ovulation, it was uh, 35%. And then one day before ovulation, it was 40%. And then it has decreased on the day of ovulation, the probability has decreased. So... They gave you some sort of a data. You need to understand this data days before ovulation, percentage probability of uh, pregnancies. Now, the study shows a probability of 20% that sexual intercourse three days before ovulation will result in pregnancy. Three days before ovulation. Right? State how many times more likely pregnancy is if sexual intercourse takes place two days later. So, two days later means what? You've got to figure that out. Two days later means what? Two days, three minus two. So, you have to understand how many times more likely pregnancy will occur. You see, two days later means on day one. Now, on day one, as you see, it is 40%. So, from 20% here, this has doubled. So it doubles. So it is twice as likely, or if you could have said, if, it is, if you had said the same thing, twice as likely, or if you said doubles, then you got your one mark for that. So simple how you deduce that, that is the important thing. Twice as likely, or as it doubles, so you got your one mark for that. Then a very direct question, explain the role of named hormones in the menstrual cycle during the days investigated by the study. So, of course, it's very easy. FSH uh, results in the maturation of the follicle. Then uh, it is happening in the ovary. Then the estrogen will cause the repair of the wall of the uterus. And the LH will increase uh, just at the time of ovulation. So, we have to be talking about FSH, estrogen, and LH. FSH, estrogen, and LH. Uh, if you're not clear about this, you need to revise the graph and you need to go through the videos on which I've given this. So FSH causes the growth in the follicle, uh, where in the ovary, and the estrogen causes the repair of the uterus lining, and LH, of course, is increases just before ovulation and results in the process of ovulation, which is the uh, release of the ovum from the surface of the ovary into the oviduct. Now, coming on to the next part of the question. Uh, the diagram shows a fetus developing in the uterus of a pregnant female human. So structure X and that says name structure X and describe the function of this structure. Now, of course, the name of the organ was the placenta, but what does it do? It allows the transfer of substances. I always say this is the Vaga border between India and Pakistan. Allows people to cross from one place to the other. So it is just a barrier between the mother's blood and the fetal blood. It doesn't 
the blood can never mix because it could be a different blood group. Of course, and the pressures are also, the mother's blood has a higher pressure. So there's a diffusion of what? Diffusion of oxygen and glucose because the fetus when it's developing cannot inhale and exhale. But it is respiring, please remember. But it cannot inhale and exhale. So diffusion of oxygen and glucose from the mother to the fetus, then a carbon dioxide from the fetus to the mother, because the fetal cells are respiring and producing carbon dioxide. Then also the placenta produces progesterone. Then the fact that the molecules diffuse from one blood to the other blood, maternal blood to the fetal blood, or from the fetal blood to the maternal blood. And there is, remember, no mixing of the two bloods ever takes place. Now coming to question number five, some laundry detergents used to wash clothes contain enzymes. These enzymes break down the molecules that cause stains. Suggest enzymes that may be components of a laundry detergent that will break down stains made of starch. You've dropped some rice on your uh, clothes or you've dropped some uh, butter or oil or you've had some pakoras and you've dropped that on your clothes. So the starch digesting would be amylase because if your starch is digested to maltose and then that will be easily washed off and the fat is digested by the enzyme lipase to fatty acid and glycerol and that will wash off the stain. So you'll have a stain-free clothes. Now it says savonase is a protease enzyme produced by genetically engineered bacteria. The enzyme is a component of laundry detergents. The graph shows the results of an investigation into the effects of temperature and pH on the rate of 7As activity. Now here you can see the rate of 7As activity is this. What is the temperature? It is 60 degrees Celsius. So optimum is 60 degrees Celsius. Here when we look at the pH, then we have the pH is 9, which is the optimum pH and this is the one. And before that, of course, rate is lesser and after that the rate is lesser. Similarly, in the temperature, the rate is lesser before 60 and more after uh, is also decreases the rate after 60 between 60 and 90. Now coming to the next part of the question, as you can see here, what do we have in the next part of the question? We have uh, described how the effect of temperature on savonase activity differs from the effect of temperature on a protease that functions in the human stomach. Now here you can see, of course, it is different. Why is it different is because in the human stomach, it works at 37, while here the optimum is 60 degrees Celsius. And of course, you could talk of the denaturation of the enzyme. That would be after 37. Here it is a denaturing after 60 degrees Celsius. And, uh, any of these points would be fine. Optimum 60 degrees Celsius, not 37 degrees Celsius. That would be another marking scheme point. And denatures from 60 to 90, while that denatures above 37. Then part two of the question suggests why laundry detergents that contain savonases also contain chemicals that dissolve to form an alkaline solution. Well, you can understand that from this here. You see, it's the pH 9, it's working. So above pH 9 would, of course, be rate would be decreasing, and below pH 9, the rate is again decreasing. So why did we add a chemical? So we could provide the optimum pH, and uh, it will prevent denaturation, and detergents will be more effective, and the clothes will be much cleaner. So optimum pH for enzyme prevents denaturation, and detergent is much more effective, and the clothes are much more cleaner. You see all these detergent ads which show you how dirty the clothes were and then suddenly how clean they are. Uh, coming to the last part of the question, after washing clothes using laundry detergents, the wastewater is sometimes released into the environment. The wastewater contains inorganic phosphate ions that are also found in fertilizers. Explain the harmful effect on aquatic life of releasing this wastewater into the environment. And this is for four marks and total marks were 11. Now, of course, this is a very simple form of water pollution. So you said water pollution or just pollution, you got a mark for that. And this results in eutrophication, which is a very named, it's a biological name. So if you got, if you knew that, well, you got a mark for that. And then if you explained it, what happens is that, you know, when you add nitrates and phosphates, so more increased growth of algae, increased growth of algae means more algae. So more algae dies, falls to the bottom of the pond. The bacteria in the pond now have a lot of dead decomposing matter. So the number of bacteria increase when the bacteria respire aerobically. They use the oxygen of the water. So less oxygen is available and the fish start to die. So if you knew all that, well, you would have got your, your four marks and you would have been able to do this question. Uh, that finishes this uh, part of the thing. And thank you very much. And thank you for watching my channel. And thank you for subscribing. And thank you for leaving comments and all the very best in the future exams.